Hi everyone, welcome to the World Environment Week Conversations, where every day we are talking to some really cool and interesting people that work in conservation, both marine and land uh, environment spaces. And today we have Flossie. So welcome Flossie. Uh, we're really looking forward to having a chat. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, hi everyone. So I'm studying my PhD. I'm working on conservation management of small isolated populations and how we can protect them into the future. Um, I'm using a, a very cute animal as my case study. It's the Norfolk Island moorpork. And I'll just share my screen with you so that you can just see what the Norfolk Island moorpork looks like. Uh, here it is. So as you can see, it's a very oh. cute small owl. Um, and yes, they are endemic, which means they can only be found on Norfolk Island. And um, they've actually got a very interesting history. So originally there was only one female left in the world. And um, so they had to introduce two closely related moorporks from New Zealand onto the island to, to breed with her. And she bred with one of them. And so now we've got an Adam and Eve situation where all of the owls that currently exist um, on Norfolk Island are all derived from these two individuals. Um, but the main threat to the owls, um, of course, is inbreeding, but also is um, lack of habitat. So they don't have um, enough vegetation to maintain a, a large enough colony size on the island. So that's something that I'll be looking at as well. And that's certainly something that is a theme, isn't it, for many animals is habitat loss, for sure. Yeah. And I guess having so few, I mean, they'd really be listed as critically endangered, which again is the same for many other animals. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, and they actually were classified as extinct once um, guess, because wow. they decided that the hybridization was, um, it, it wasn't, they weren't the Norfolk Island Moorpork anymore, but then um, some researchers were like, no, this is still the Norfolk Island Moorpork. Okay. Um, so they're, they're back on the um, species list, but yes, critically endangered for sure. And, and certainly even with the breeding program not not clear out of the woods and safe by any means. No, they, they actually, um, the reason why my PhD started um, was because they haven't been breeding since. Well, we have no successful um, known breeding attempts since 2011. Oh. So that was eight years without any successful breeding. Um, but two owls were reared uh, on my last field season there, which was very exciting. Awesome. So yeah. obviously your PhD is taking up a fair bit of time, but it's not the only thing that you do in terms of marine conservation. And one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you is because of your work with uh, penguins around St Kilda. So could you tell us how you got involved in that role? Yeah, so um, not a lot of people know this, but actually in St Kilda, there is a colony of penguins. And um, this is where I am today. I'm out on the breakwater. Um, I've actually got a, a oyster catcher behind me as well. And we get them awesome. out on the breakwater, which is really cool. But yes, penguins is mostly what I spend my time out there working on. So um, actually, my, my grandpa um, loves penguins. And I went out there one time with him and uh, we were talking to the Earth Care St Kilda volunteers, um, the penguin guides who go out there and talk to people about the penguins and make sure everyone's doing the right thing. And, um, and yeah, I just got talking to someone and said, you know, what are you, what are you guys doing? And I found out that there was a research project um, that happened, so that was really exciting. And then I was actually doing a snorkel with Marine Care Ricketts Point, um, just going out with the group of people there and I met um, I met Julianne and she told me that she's on the research team and she could get me involved and so then that was that was the start of it <laughs> and I haven't looked back I'm now um, I'm now coordinating the research team there um, and it's it's a lot of work but um, it's super fun we go out every fortnight and we catch penguins um, we microchip them and we weigh them we find out what sex they are and we take recordings on um, how many eggs and how many chicks they have. And speaking of that, I should show you a picture of a penguin. Um, <laughs> let's get out the cutest one I have. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh. This is just a little penguin chick in its nest. And, and so you can tell that's a chick because it has those very sort of 
fluffy feathers um, rather than their waterproof feathers. Yeah. It's a very cute one. So the research, it's all voluntary. Yeah. Right? This is not your job. So you do this as well as your PhD. So that's, that's, that's pretty amazing to yeah, commit exactly that kind right. of, you must, be, you must be pretty passionate about it. Yeah, look, it is a lot of work. Um, and yes, it is all voluntary, but I, I really do love it. It's, it's very rewarding. Um, I think, think that um, there's a lot of, of, there are a lot of animals that need our help. Um, and thankfully, I work with penguins and owls. I think that's definitely one of the reasons why I love working with penguins is that they're exposed to a lot of issues, um, but people care about payments and so it helps to make people care about the issues as well. It does. Um, I guess that there's been a little bit of a respite for the penguins over the last couple of months with mm. all the restrictions of COVID-19. Have you seen any um, improvements for them in that time? You know, uh, less litter around or, you know, um, less sort of, you know, being impacted by people just coming and sort of disturbing them? Yeah, well, um, the lack of disturbance from the people we would imagine is definitely a good thing. Um, as you can see here, um, the penguins often get up onto the onto the boardwalk um, or, or that top that path at the top of the breakwater. Um, penguins share this path with people, and in the summer months when there's heaps of people, it, it's really um, you can only imagine that it's not great for them. They need to get to their chicks, and if there's legs in the way, they can't get there. Um, but actually the research so far is not showing any really serious impacts of the people, which, which is positive. But of course, there's so many things that we can't look at um, to really get the, the perfect picture about what's going on. But on the surface, it, it doesn't seem to be bothering them too much. They're still breeding there. Um, we still get um, chicks and eggs being successfully reared in the public section, which is a really great sign, but also just, um, you know, proves that we really do need to make sure we're taking care of the public section because it's an important um, part of the colony. So yeah, they're getting a bit of a rest um, from people, which I think I think we could probably all agree is, is going to be a good thing. Um, unfortunately, the rubbish, however, um, we had our first research night on Sunday night after not being at it for, I think, the last two or three months. And um, unfortunately, there was heaps of rubbish. I'll, um, I'll pull up another photo. We had quite a number of nests that all had rubbish um, in them. So the penguins are about to start breeding. And so they're, they're preparing all their nests at the moment. Um, and they bring in bits of rubbish to, to build their nests, which is really unfortunate. Um, yeah, as you like, can see. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. So they actually collect the rubbish. It's not that it's blown in or washed in or been dropped there. They have actually brought that back to the nest. They've actually specifically gone and taken that into their nest. Um, wow. But it definitely, uh, it definitely does blow in to the colony. So that was, that was the thing I was going to mention is that they, with the breakwater closed, we're not having people dropping rubbish, which is great but it's really showing that because we had so many nests that were polluted and still so much rubbish around that no matter where you drop rubbish, it, all sources of water end up in the bay around Victoria and, or not around Victoria, around Port Phillip Bay. And, and so once they're in the water, they can end up anywhere. And unfortunately the breakwater does end up catching a fair bit of rubbish. And then it's just all right there for the penguins to take when they should be taking things like salt bush, um, which I think you can see behind me, there's bits of salt bush. Um, oh, yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And, um, or, or here's another, um, this is a bit of salt bush up here. Um, they should be taking bits of salt bush and putting that into their nest um, or leaves, like you saw in the previous picture. But um, pulling bits of salt bush off the branches is not as easy as just picking up a bit of rubbish. And yeah. And, it, and obviously animals don't know that rubbish is harmful and they're going to take whatever they can find that's available. That's right. It feels soft to them, but they don't understand that it can hold water. And so if they lay an egg into a little puddle of water that's collected in some rubbish, that's obviously not going to be good for, their, for the success of that egg. So the egg needs to be dry. That's the whole purpose of bringing the leaves and the salt bush in to, to keep it dry and out of the, the weather. 
yeah and and warm so yeah the the if it's if it's constantly wet it's really hard for the penguins to keep it warm but also um yeah sadly eggs eggs can drown if it's wet enough how many penguins roughly are at the colony? So the current estimate is that there is 1,400 penguins, which is wow. yeah, it's quite a few. <laughs> That's a lot more than I was expecting you to say. I mean, it's obviously not on a par with the major colony on Phillip Island, but that's a significant number. Yeah, yeah, they, they're, they're doing pretty well considering their circumstances. They're doing really well. Have they been there for a, a long time historically? Do you, do you know that? So the breakwater was built in 1956 um, for the Melbourne Olympics. Um, and so, yeah, and then the penguins uh, moved in shortly after that. I, I think it only took a few years before, the, before penguins started being seen there. Wow. Um, then the colony's just been growing ever since. So would it be fair to say that the popularity for, in terms of the public has definitely increased a lot more recently? Um, like I said, a lot of people yeah. still don't know, but I think it's definitely becoming more of a, a tourist attraction, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Uh, the Earth Care Penguin Guide program started uh, 10, maybe 11 years ago now. Um, because the researchers noticed that there were more and more people appearing. Um, and so that um, program started off as just a few people coming part, um, doing volunteering on the weekend to talk to the visitors. Then that turned into, oh, that was just in the weekend in summer. Then it turned into weekends and weekdays in summer, but nothing in winter. Then it turned into weekdays and weekends in summer, weekends in winter, and now it's all year round. It's oh, just, wow. yeah, every night of the year there are penguin guides there because it's just gotten that popular that it's year round. There's always, there's always crowds. And, um, and, and I can imagine it would actually be a little easier in the winter because obviously that you, you need it to be dusk and going dark before they return and that happens earlier. So mm. more accessible for you know, more people rather than waiting until nine, 10 o'clock at night. So I could see why people would come in the winter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, if uh, obviously this is going out to um, a lot of my Marine ambassadors who are all sort of grade six at the moment um, in the future, you know, could some of them become involved in helping out in, in projects like yours and, and others? Is there an age limit or, you know, what would they have to do to be able to, to volunteer? Yeah, for sure. So um, we do ask that volunteers are 16 and over, um, but you can definitely do penguin guiding with a guardian. So if, oh, if wow. um, anyone has parents who are willing to go out with them, that's definitely something that they can do. Um, but there's, there's so many things that people can get involved in. So earth care, we obviously focus a lot on penguins, but we've also got um, We've got breakwater cleanups, so picking up rubbish from around the penguins. Anyone of any age can help with that. Or with um, plantings around the Elwood foreshore to help with reef vegetation, like we mentioned, habitat loss being an extreme problem. Yep. Um, the Eco Centre has um, some good um, breakwater planting programs as well, which I, I think um, yeah, grade six would be able to get involved in. Um, but yeah, I really do think that um, I wouldn't be where I am today getting to do the, the cool research that I am without all the volunteering that I did um, and just whatever I could, um, whether it is, yeah, going for a snorkel at Ricketts Point with a group of people or, yeah, anything, it all, it all helps towards getting to this point. Sure. So just, just to sort of wrap up, if we want to, um, you know, help the penguins, um, what, in terms of, what can we do as respectful visitors when we come to visit the penguins and what should we be doing sort of every day to look after the marine environment? Yeah, well, um, specifically if you're going to the penguins, make sure you've got flash photography turned off and no white light allowed. Um, make sure you're keeping your distance from the penguins. So we ask that people stay at least three meters away. Um, they are shy little things. They'll, they'll get pretty close to you, but um, if you're in their way, they're, they're just going to stay there and they're not going to go where they want to go. Um, so make sure you keep your distance. Definitely no touching the penguins. 
um, and keeping off the rocks and the sand as well because um, penguins nest under the rocks um, and so you never know where you might be standing and if you're on the sand they also might not um, be as likely to come in that way which is a really cool way for people to get to watch the penguins come in yeah. um, and then yeah more uh, more broadly speaking I think that essentially anything that you do for the environment um, is going to benefit the marine systems and, and the penguins, like climate change, plastic pollution, um, you know, all, all these issues, they're all linked and they all do impact the penguins. So really try and minimise your waste where possible um, and always put it in the bin and, you know, just be environmentally conscious in terms of what you can do to minimise climate change and things like that. Fantastic. Great advice. And I guess also my thoughts were that if, you know, you do go and have a look at the penguins and it looks exceptionally busy, maybe choose to come back another day when it's not quite so full of people and just to sort of give them a little bit more space, the penguins, because we can always want to do things, but sometimes we have to maybe put the animals welfare before our own. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree. And, you know, um, school holidays, extremely busy. So why not try and convince your parents to go out on a school night and go and see the penguins because it'll be better for the penguins. That's, you know, there'll be less people. And if you do it in winter, there'll be even less people and it won't be too late either. So, yeah. Exactly. And you'll probably get a better view too with less people. Yeah. So it's a win-win for everybody. For sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Flossie. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. It's been so interesting to hear. I learned something myself. I did not know there were 1,400 <laughs> penguins in the colony so that's really um something interesting for me to take away from this um and i love your work and i wish you all the best with your phd and looking forward to seeing more cute pictures of more porks when you get back out to norfolk island um and yeah thanks yeah. for your time and i hope that anyone and if anyone's interested they can jump on the earth care website and find out more information about all of the different projects yeah, that's right. Fantastic. Yeah. And if anyone has any questions that, you know, that you still want answers, if you want to send them through to me and I will uh, pass them on to Flossie and I'm sure she'd be happy to, to answer them. So thanks so for much, sure. Flossie. Awesome. No worries. Uh, Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. So guys, thanks for listening and tune in again tomorrow for another great conversation. See ya.